like it's a good idea every now and then to get, get a break from the TV screen and from the video game screen and from the smartphone screen. It's a good idea every now and then to get a break from the, the screens that we have here as well. So tonight we're going to do this lesson the old-fashioned way right here. A Bible thumping, sweat wiping, slobber slinging, preaching sermon tonight here is uh, what we're going to do. That's right. And the splash zone, poor Rachel here, you guys are going to be in big trouble here tonight, Aiden. So uh, I'll try to direct the sweat a uh, few different directions. Uh, before I get started with the lesson, though, tonight, there were a couple of personal things I wanted to talk with you about just to share with you. As you guys know, uh, who've been here for a while, uh, in July, I usually, two of my three weeks of vacation I take in July because of uh, things related to my hobby of, of barbershop singing. And uh, that's coming up here. Uh, I'm going to be heading out to beautiful Salt Lake City for a convention this coming week. And then a couple weeks later, go teach at a singing school. But uh, this, this month's going to be hard for me personally. I'd just like to ask you to, to pray for me. It was this time last year <clears throat> at the International Convention, which happened to be in Orlando, that we could really see that Christy's breathing was um, compromised. I remember she came uh, over to the convention center where my chorus was rehearsing, and she just could not walk the whole way to get to where we were. Uh, and not only that, but this week, there's going to be a lot of friends of mine from other places that I have not seen since Christy passed away, and they're all going to be coming to me to express their condolences, which I really appreciate. But at the same time, as you all who've been through this know, it just kind of reopens and reopens and reopens some of the grief. So if you could just keep me in mind. Then a, a couple weeks later, last year, I didn't go to the singing school to teach, quite honestly, because I felt like my time with Christy was running out. I just didn't want to go out of town. Uh, <clears throat> but this year, um, there's a general session before the school actually starts, and there's a speaker usually. And this year they've asked me to speak to talk about grief and music and, and the support and so forth that that can give you, which I'm really very honored to do and really excited to do in honor of Christy, but it's just going to be another tough experience. So if you could keep me in mind here over the next uh, few weeks, I, I would appreciate that. Uh, but what's wonderful is we do have uh, very capable teachers and preachers who will be teaching while I'm gone. Uh, Dean will be finishing up the book of Acts. And uh, next uh, Sunday, Andrew is going to teach class for us and then preach for us. And that brings up the other personal thing that I wanted to talk about tonight. Because I'm going to be gone this week, when I get back, Rachel and Andrew and the kids will be gone. So this is my last opportunity to say something about them personally. And when they came here to be with us, I saw in them something I've seen many times through my life. And that is I saw a young preacher and his family totally demoralized. It breaks my heart when I see that. I've been so blessed in my life in the churches that I have worked with to have very good, very positive experiences. And, and to this day, good relationships with all the, the churches where I have previously preached who've been so kind to me. So I really wanted to do all that I could to pass on to Andrew and to Rachel and to the kids the kind of encouragement that I've been given elsewhere and especially the kind of encouragement that I've been given here. And unfortunately, because of our own personal circumstances, uh, I just did not have the kind of time and energy that I wish I could have had to devote to Andrew as to be a mentor to him and to Rachel as an encouragement. And what so excites me and thrills me is all that lacked and all that I've tried to be, the church here has, in a more than abundant way, done to encourage them, which is clear from the things you've heard Andrew and Rachel say about the fellowship here. So I'm just very excited that 
uh, you guys are leaving here in a different place than when you came. And so excited for the opportunities that await. And really excited that maybe the next time you all come and visit, Genevieve will say hello to me. I don't know that that's going to happen. Right now she runs in sheer terror. But maybe someday that will happen. But uh, we love you guys and, and uh, we, wish, uh, we wish the very best for you. All right. Well, tonight what I want to talk with you about is sort of to tie up some things we've discussed this quarter with regard to evangelism. One of the challenges with regard to evangelism is that uh, there are some people who have certain misconceptions about what the Bible teaches regarding baptism, and it's what I want to talk with you about tonight. Uh, there are many people who believe that because the Bible teaches that we are saved by God's grace <clears throat> and through our faith, that baptism is not a part of our response to the offer of the gospel. What they might say is that baptism is a good work, but they would say that we're not saved by our works. We are saved by God's grace, and we are saved by faith. I would imagine that those of you who have study Bibles, I'm kind of looking around here to see if there's, oh, look here, Brother Haley has one, front and center. I would imagine a lot of you who have study Bibles have noticed that when you come, oh, this is the old Thompson chain reference. Yes, you don't have your, all right, very good. But those of you who have study Bibles have probably noticed that along with the helpful information those Bibles have, sometimes they have comments to this effect. Like if you were to read Acts 2.38, where Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for forgiveness of sins. You've probably read comments to the effect that, now, of course, Peter does not mean that we are to be baptized to receive forgiveness because baptism is a work, and we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. And if you haven't seen that maybe in the notes of a study Bible, I would imagine you've heard somebody at some point say that. By a show of hands, how many of you have heard something like that? Okay. So what I want to talk with you about tonight is the relationship of faith, baptism, and works. So let's set the stage, first of all, tonight by talking about what the Bible says concerning God's grace and our faith. And if you turn back to what our scripture reading was tonight, which is in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians is one of those classic letters of Paul where in the first half of the letter he talks about God's work of redemption, and then in the second half of the letter, he talks about how we should live in view of that redemption. So when you come here to chapter 2 of Ephesians, you are right smack dab in the middle of Paul's explanation of what God has done for us in Christ. You can see that in the first three verses, he talks about the dire spiritual condition of all of us outside of Christ. In verse 1, we're dead in trespasses and sins. In verse 2, we are following the prince of the power of the air. In other words, the devil, that's who that's what we're talking about, the devil, we're in spiritual bondage. In verse 3, we, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and we're by nature children of wrath. We are facing the wrath of God because of this utter sinfulness in which we live. Then verse 4 says, but, what a wonderful conjunction, but, in spite of that, God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God loved us, not because we were so unlovable, so deserving, but even when we were dead, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him and seated him in the heavenly, with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We are a display of the gracious, merciful work of God in Christ. For, verse 8, by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So when someone says we are saved by grace through faith and not according to works, they are exactly right 
It's book, chapter, and verse, what Paul says here. And even though I'm not going to use the screen tonight, I do want to use a visual aid tonight. I want to use this table here as a visual aid. <clears throat> and what this table represents is the phrase, not by. Not by. And what Paul says is we are saved by grace through faith. That's this side of the table. Not by or not according to works lest any man should boast. So yeah, we are saved by grace, through faith, not according to works. Now, lest someone think that that means somehow works of obedience play no part in the Christian life, notice what Paul goes on to say in the next verse, in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So here's another thing this table could represent. It can represent not by, but also could represent for. We are saved by grace through faith, not by our works, but for good works. There's a purpose for which we've been saved. This is the pattern of the Bible. Why did God save Israel in, the, in Egypt? So they could serve him. And why does God save us? So we can serve him. The key distinction here is the works that we do are not the ground or cause of our salvation. They are the result or fruit of our salvation. But if we have genuinely been saved by grace through faith, then a living, active, vibrant faith will display itself in that kind of obedience. Everybody with me so far? A lot of people think Paul and James are at odds with each other, but this is exactly what James was saying, right? Do you remember the passage in James chapter 2? In James chapter 2 where James is dealing with people who claim they are believers, but there's absolutely no evidence of faith in their lives. So he says this in James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Paul in Ephesians 2 says, faith is not going to be by itself. When you are saved by grace through faith, you're saved not by works, but you are saved in order to do good works. And you are to be the workmanship of Christ. James here says the same thing. If you have genuine saving faith, that genuine saving faith will be on display in the way that you live. So that's what scripture says about salvation by grace through faith, not according to works, but unto or for good works. Here is the question then. If you conceive of this table as the dividing line, on which side of the line does the Bible place baptism? Does the Bible place baptism on the side of the dividing line of a good work that Christians do, like in James 2, feeding the hungry, clothing those who are naked, and being baptized? Is it that kind of good work? Or... Does the Bible talk about baptism on this side of the equation in connection with our response to God's grace by our faith? That's the rest of the issue that we're going to deal with tonight, and we're going to start in Galatians, the third chapter. Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians, Paul is addressing a serious misunderstanding about the gospel which says that the gospel itself is not enough. You also need the law of Moses and particularly circumcision that essentially to be a Christian you must become a Jew first, either by national race and birth or by conversion to Judaism. Paul's point in Galatians 3 is Abraham's faith is designed to show us that you can be justified before God without the law of Moses, without circumcision. So in Galatians 3, Paul says this in verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Who are the sons of Abraham? 
those of faith. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's the promise in chapter 12 of Genesis. It's the promise reiterated after the story of the near offer of Isaac in Genesis 22. So then, verse 9, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So according to verse 7, how can we become a son of Abraham? And the answer is by faith. Well then, what's the law of Moses' purpose? Why did God give the law of Moses? Well, Paul says this in chapter 3 and verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. The law of Moses, in part, was given to restrain sin. Kind of like right now, they have, I've noticed, maybe it's because I always talk about how dangerous I feel Highway 60 is, but have you noticed they've got right now uh, not only the speed limit sign. Like, Mark, did you do this? There's not only the speed limit sign, but also one of those warnings that shows you how fast you're going. So theoretically, it can restrain sin. But of course, if you've got sinful people, a law will not only restrain sin, but on the other hand, it can sometimes multiply sin, right? And it can show you, without question, you are a sinner. So verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. If a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be, indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisons everything under sin. The law makes it abundantly clear you're a sinner. So that we recognize the need for a Savior, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. All right, so when do we receive that promise? When do we become, in the language of verse 7, a son of Abraham? Verse 25, now that faith has come, we are no longer a guardian, under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So which side of the dividing line are we on here? Over here, right? Sons of God through faith for the reason being, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Notice what Paul says here. You become a son of God by faith. But then in verse 27, he says, how does that happen? It happens, he says, when you are baptized into Christ and put Christ on. So according to this passage, does baptism belong over here in the category of works that we do? No. Paul says, this is how you become a son of God by faith. In baptism, you put Christ on so that he then essentially becomes your uniform. Look at verse 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You're all one in Christ. And if you are Christ's, then you are what? Abraham's offspring or seed, heirs according to the promise. We become a son of Abraham, a son of God, by faith in Christ when we are baptized into Christ. Paul does not put baptism in the category of works. In this passage, he clearly describes it as the flip side of the coin of faith in Christ. That's passage number one. Let's look at a second passage. I'm going to go in order tonight. So we're going to go over to Colossians, the second chapter. Colossians, the second chapter. It's been a while, but we studied Colossians not all that long ago. And you may recall that the big issue in the book of Colossians is some strange heresy that had infiltrated, or at least I should say threatened to infiltrate, the church at Colossae. So Paul writes the Colossians to tell them, You've got all you need in Jesus Christ. Don't, don't buy what these heretics are offering you. So verse 6 says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. You can be established in Christ. You don't need what these guys are selling. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to, and your Bible may say something like the elementary things or elementary spirits or elemental spirits, not according to Christ. Uh, we talked about it in class. I'm not really sure what Paul's talking about there. Nobody is. 
But what's certainly clear is he says, what they are offering you is not going to get you anything. Jesus gives you all that you need. For, verse 9, in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you've been filled with in him who is the head of all rule and authority. You've got all you need in Christ, including new life. Verse 11, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh. Paul uses a simple illustration here. It's a surgical illustration. The specific surgery he has in mind is the surgery of circumcision, but all of us can relate to it. It's like the removal of a cancerous tumor or the removal of an inflamed appendix. Paul says that Christ has cut away that which threatened our spiritual well-being, what sometimes the Bible calls the flesh, not in the sense of the material body, but in the sense of lustful passions like the works of the flesh. So Christ has performed a spiritual operation, a spiritual circumcision, Paul says, not made by hands, at the end of verse 11, by the circumcision of Christ. Now, when has Christ done this? When has he performed this surgery? Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Do you see that in verse 12 that Paul says, first of all, this cutting away of our sinfulness happened when we were buried with Christ in baptism. And secondly, Paul specifically says that in baptism, we are raised with him through what? Through faith. Faith in what? Our work? God's work, the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. In this passage, Paul does not talk about baptism as our work. He says that baptism is our faith in God's work to cut away and remove our sinfulness. When I used to preach up in Illinois, we had a, a young lady whose name was Hasmin, who when she was about 10 years old, started complaining one day of nausea and a terrible pain in her lower right side. So they rushed her up to the emergency room, and when I found out, I ran over to the hospital and got up to her room, and I was talking with, with, with her and her mom, and then this nurse with the worst beds... Nurse Cratchit comes into the room and she goes, yeah, it's your appendix. We're going to have to take it out. So here this poor little 10-year-old girl is now terrified, starts crying because we're going to have to go do surgery. But, of course, they had to go do surgery because there is something that's a part of her that now is threatening to take her life. If it ruptures and, and all the toxins go through her body and she goes into sepsis, she could die. So she had to be taken to surgery. Now, she herself is not going to remove her appendix. I can't imagine any. If you think you know somebody who did, it's a fish story big time, right? So she's going to have to go, and somebody else is going to do the work. She's just going to have to trust that what they've told her is right, that they've direct, uh, correctly diagnosed her condition, and that the surgeon can do what needs to be done to remove the appendix. And fortunately, it worked out just fine. The only bad thing that happened is I went up to see her the next day, and I started joking around with her, and she started laughing, and she pulled some of her stitches. So I felt really bad. I left her in stitches, though. So, yeah. They're not any funnier when I'm this close, are they? It's pretty much the same, right? Well, so anyway, everything worked out just fine. So here is my point. Did Hasmin leave the hospital going, well, you should see what I did for myself. I got rid of my appendix. Not at all. She had a problem. She needed the surgeon to remove the problem. All she did is trust in him to do the work. He did the work. She trusted in his work. Paul says we need to have our sinfulness removed from us by a spiritual surgery or circumcision, and that's what happens when we are baptized into Christ, 
And therefore, it's simply our faith in the powerful working of God that just as he raised Jesus from the dead, he can bring us from death to life through this spiritual surgery. The point is that that means that baptism belongs on this side of the equation. It's a part of our faith response to God. It is not a work we do. It is a work that God does. Which means a couple of things, incidentally. Number one, it means that proper baptism in the New Testament must be preceded by and accompanied by faith. This is not something for infants. For little children who do not have the capacity to know they are sinners, much less to trust in Jesus Christ to save them. It means that it should be accompanied by faith. But here's the other thing it means. It means it should be accompanied by faith. If somebody decides one day, well, you know, I've heard preachers talk about getting baptized, so I guess I'll go get baptized. But there's no awareness that in baptism you're trusting in God to work on you. Then all that's happened is you've gotten wet. You've been submerged in water. You've not been baptized in the way that Paul talks about in this passage. All right, let's look at another one tonight. Look with me in the book of Titus. The book of Titus, the third chapter. It seems like Timothy gets more attention than Titus, but Titus was another young, very capable disciple, another son in the faith for the Apostle Paul. He's been sent to the island of Crete, which based on the reputation Crete had in the ancient world, is a tough work and means that Titus must be indeed quite a formidable preacher to tackle the problems there. And Paul has sent him to Titus to, as Paul says, set in order, which involves to some extent ordering the uh, leadership of the church by uh, establishing elders, but also just instructing the people how they are supposed to live. That's what we're going to pick up with here in chapter 3 and verse 1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy. And this phrase is so biting. Hated by others and hating one another. It's, to me, an, an important practical point for us tonight as Christians. The reason Paul says in verses 1 and 2, tell your people to be humble, submissive, doing good works, not quarreling, is because that's what we all used to be. We know what that's like. Let's not be that way anymore. Let's be different people, different from the world. Do you think if you went this week and you were humble, submissive, respectful, and didn't quarrel, that you would be different from the people you work with? Some of you would be very different from the people you work with because of the environment you're in. But that's what Paul is saying here. All right, then he says, though, here's what made the difference for us. Verse 4, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. Same thing as Ephesians 2. But according to his own mercy. So on this side where we've got grace, faith, we could also put the word mercy. According to his mercy. Mercy is like uh, we sing about tonight when Ethan led, uh, Great is thy faithfulness, his mercies are new every morning. So verse 5 says, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, but notice what else he says, by two things. What are they? The washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Now, do you see here that Paul says what we are saved by is not by works, but what we are saved by is the washing of regeneration. What does that mean about the washing of regeneration? What side does it belong on? This side over here. <coughs> the side that's grace and faith and mercy. It's not the side that is our works. Because Paul says it's not by our works, it's by God's grace. But he says that in God's mercy he has saved us by the washing of regeneration. 
which if you go back and read ancient commentators, they are unanimous. Paul's talking about baptism here. And this is one of many passages that talks about baptism and the Holy Spirit in the same breath. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and gift of the Holy Spirit. John 3, you must be born of the water and the Spirit. Uh, so we've seen passages like that all through. This is just another one here. And Paul says that when we are saved, it's not by our works. It is by the mercy of God, but it is also by or through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. It's a classic text that spells out in clear terms that baptism does not belong on the side of works, but rather in the category of our faith response to God's grace and mercy. All right, how are you people doing so far tonight? You got one more in you. You look at one more passage. All right, let's look over to the book of 1 Peter, the third chapter. <clears throat> 1 Peter, the third chapter. By the way, <clears throat> when I get back from this vacation time, I immediately, in addition to the regular work that I do for us, I'm going to spend a couple of day, uh, uh, parts of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, also working with a bunch of young preachers who are all coming uh, into Tampa for a few days. And uh, one of the things that I'm supposed to do is be a guinea pig and do a sermon in front of all of them. And the sermon I've been asked to do is to talk about Mark 8, 22 through 26. So you were the guinea pigs this morning. The problem is I've told you've got 20 minutes. So I didn't tell you this morning that I've got to get this done in 20 minutes because I knew you'd all be going nah, nah, all during the sermon. And as you may have noticed, I failed miserably. So I got a lot of work to do to edit to get that thing ready by the time those boys all come, boys, those young men, those boys like Andrew all come in here in a couple of weeks. But anyway, all right, so 1 Peter chapter 3, we learn in the book of 1 Peter that the Christians he's writing to uh, are not being persecuted by the government yet. It's a possibility, but it hasn't happened yet. But they certainly are under uh, social stigma. He talks about them being slandered, reviled. Uh, they have experienced maligning. So there is some suffering going on. But he knows it could be more serious. But even if it does get much more serious, which of course we know from history that it does, he assures them, look, you can deal with it. So he says in chapter 3, in verse 17, it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. And then he points them to the ultimate example of righteous suffering. Verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water, or your version may say, saved by water. Now, just a pause here. This reference to Christ going in the spirit and proclaiming or preaching to spirits in prison has about 8 million different interpretations as to what Peter is talking about. Uh, you can go back onto the website and listen to our class where we talked about this. I would recommend you go further back and listen to Marty's class where he talked about it. It's a tough passage. There's a lot of different options. Uh, is he talking about Christ going to the realm of the dead and basically proclaiming victory over the evil powers that once existed. That's one common possibility. Is he saying that Christ went and preached back in the days of Noah through Noah? That's another possibility. But in any event, as Peter talks about Christ's suffering and his experience of death and then resurrection, it triggers this comment about the preaching that in one way or another, who knows for sure, involved the time of Noah. And in bringing up the story of Noah, which naturally leads to the story of the flood, it makes a point 
about a decisive break from your past. That just as in the case of Noah, the flood represented a decisive break from the old corrupt world for Noah's family, there was something in our experience as Christians that like Noah's flood also involves water and also is the decisive break from our past. And what is it that is parallel? Well, look at verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this now saves you. Now, my point here is not to be obnoxious. But if anyone says, we are saved by grace, not by works, therefore baptism plays no part in the salvation process. This flat assertion by Peter is just a huge problem. He specifically says in this passage, baptism now saves you. And he says there's something about it that reminds us even of the story of Noah, which is obviously the issue of water. But he hastens to say, don't misunderstand. It's not water scrubbing away some filth from your body. Verse 21, baptism now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body. Well, if baptism saves me, and it doesn't save me because of something superficially happening to the body, then what is going on that leads to baptism saving me? The end of the verse explains, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Now, how many of your Bibles say pledge of a good conscience? Raise your hands. Pledge, pledge of a good conscience. I think those are my New King James people. Is that right? In an NIV people, the pledge of a good conscience. How many of your Bibles say appeal of a good conscience? There's a reason why most of us just raised our hands. If you look up in the Greek dictionary what this word means, it is possible that it means pledge. And if it does mean pledge, what Paul is saying is this. Just as Noah's flood was a decisive break for his family from the old world of corruption, when you are baptized, you are making a pledge to turn away from your sins and turn toward God in a good, to have a good conscience. But normally when this word is used, it carries the idea of an appeal. And that's why most of our translations translate it that way. And if that is the case, then here's what Peter is saying. That baptism saves you because in baptism, you are appealing to God. You know that it is God who is doing the work. And in baptism, you are appealing to God to do that work. And that work, of course, has its power through the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is why the verse ends through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what is so ironic about all this is many of the people who say that baptism doesn't belong over on this side of the equation, that baptism belongs over here, they will say that the way that you express your faith is by praying a sinner's prayer. How many of you have heard people talk about a sinner's prayer? Now, as you know, in Scripture, the New Testament never talks about something like the sinner's prayer, except there is a passage which says that we appeal to God to cleanse our conscience. But guess what that passage is? It's this one. And what it's saying is that what people are thinking of when they think of the sinner's prayer is actually what baptism exactly is according to Scripture. It is in baptism in which we are appealing to God to cleanse us through the saving work of Jesus Christ. And that's why baptism belongs over here in our response to the faith a response in faith to God's grace, to trusting in him. That's why in Galatians, Paul says, we're sons of God by faith because we've been baptized. It's why he says in Colossians that in baptism we are putting our faith in the powerful working of God. It's why he says in Titus, we're not saved by our works, but by God's mercy, by the washing of regeneration. And it is why Peter says that in baptism we are appealing to God to cleanse us. That's where baptism belongs in the scheme of things. 
Baptism in the Bible is never called a human work. It is consistently depicted as the work of God, which we obtain by our faith and trust in Jesus' death. And that's our invitation for anyone here tonight who wants to become a Christian. And listen to me, listen to me. That's also our challenge. That's our challenge for those of us who have. Because it's the challenge to live like those who have received the blessings of God's grace and mercy. And if we can help you, let us know while we stand and sing.